If you'll please take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at Paul's prayer for spiritual strength for the, for the Ephesians as they struggle with him being in prison. And so, again, we recognize that he started this prayer in chapter 3, verse 1, but he doesn't actually do the prayer until verse 14, which is where we'll start this morning. Now, I don't know if you're someone who struggles with prayer or with God. It's something that, again, a lot of people begin to ask questions. That he's prayed for things. They begin to ask questions. Where were you, God, when my parents went through a divorce, when we had to deal with a sickness, where we dealt with a death, where we went through hurt and pain, where we went through a trial of losing a job, where we went through and fill in the blank. Where were you, God? There's a thing that stuck with me. It was a story that I had heard in seminary, and it was a lady who was Jewish descent whose parents were killed in the Holocaust. And I remember she coming up to a priest and yelling at the priest, where was God then? And she walked into the church. And again, I'm someone who struggles with Christ being on the cross. I don't believe in the crucifix because he's not there. But the crucifix is exactly what the woman needed to see that day because as she walked into the church and as she was yelling at God saying, where were you? She looked at the crucified Christ. Christ. And then she recognized that God understood. Paul wants the Ephesians to understand that prayer should be our first response not our last resort. It's something that we should hold on to and be strengthened by. And so I want you to hear these words this morning, starting in verse 14 through 21. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit, in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, this is your prayer that you're teaching us from the Apostle Paul, but now applies to us. So, Father, allow the Holy Spirit to, to change our hearts and to change our minds, to change our prayer life to change our focus, but more than anything that we would recognize truly the love of Christ that surpasses all of our understanding and that there we might be rooted firmly. For this we pray in Christ's name, amen. This morning we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 19 and then we'll look at verses 20 and 21 next week. So the first part of this, I want you to see that there is strength that Paul is praying for in behalf of an intercession. So again, he starts in verse 1 of chapter 3, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. It's on your behalf that we focus. It's the foundation that Paul prays this prayer for them because it looks back to verses in the chapter 1 and chapter 2 that started this, which is the gospel. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and so it's with that foundation that he begins to intercede. It's something that we should understand and grasp and, and, and recognize and understand it's our duty to intercede for one another, and that's where the power comes from. It doesn't come from my preaching. If the Holy Spirit doesn't move, if you're not praying for me, if you're not praying for the word to go out, if you're not praying for the word to do its, it's what it's supposed to do, then we waste our time. 
We can go back to the story of Moses in Exodus chapter 17. It's where he sends out um, Joshua into the battle against the Amalekites, remember? And they, they, what they had done is they had come in and they take the stragglers and they kill the stragglers. And so God sends out Joshua, but he puts Moses up on a hillside. And as Moses lifts up his, his uh, staff, he has to have Aaron and her come and hold up his hands. Because when the battle is raging, it wasn't Joshua who was winning. It was Moses who was interceding. And that is a gift that God has given to us and that we are given the opportunity to intercede for one another, to intercede, and it needs to be for the whole community. Because too often, a lot of times, we are focused and satisfied with just praying for our sphere of family and friends, our concerns, but he tells us to pray for the whole community. We're supposed to broaden our vision and our prayers for the kingdom of God. And so we have this on their behalf for the whole kingdom, but it has to come from love. See, it's, it's not just changing our actions. Changes only occur when it comes from love. Brian Chappell gives this illustration. He, he felt like he had talked to uh, um, an angel after one of his services. And what he said in his service was he says, uh, we need to have mutual accountability. We need to have a cultivation of godly habits and exercise of spiritual disciplines. And those are all good things. But the man came up to him and he said, what you've missed is you missed that we have to have a love for God more than anything. And Brian Chappell said that he felt at that moment, because he never saw the man again, that he had spoken to an angel. And this is how he responds to that incident. He says, this means that the ultimate goal of my preaching, of my parenting, of my own personal devotion suddenly becomes quite plain. I must ignite, cultivate, spark, renew, demonstrate, broadcast, signify, magnify, and preach love for the God of our redemption. What never must be absent from my spiritual instruction is that which stirs in the heart a prevailing love for the Savior. While I may have much knowledge to communicate regarding Christian obedience, thought, and duty, my greatest obligation is consistently and compassionately to fire a more profound love for God and those dear to Him. Without love, there will be no power to do what God requires. Only an overwhelming affection for him will produce an overcoming power to defeat sin. Love is power. See, and that's what we have to grasp and understand that, again, where greater love has to precede greater power. Because only love is going to truly change us. See, we can do things for a short time in our own power. But where love is, it precedes the greater power that's given to us. And so the Apostle Paul is praying, interceding for these Gentile people, and specifically the Ephesians, and he's saying, I want you to be strengthened. And he does it in a posture that, again, if you see it, it says, on my knees. Now, we recognize that that posture um, sometimes plays into things. And so typically, the Jewish person would have prayed spiritually Uh, his prayers standing up. So why does he say, I'm on my knees? It's what we read about in 2 Chronicles 6 with Solomon. When it's an overwhelming, where there's a great emotion, where there's homage to be paid, they fall down on your knees. It's in essence as Paul's knees actually buckle for the people he's praying for. He says, I care for you so much that I'm crying out to God and I fall upon my knees begging for you to understand what it is that I'm saying to you. And we recognize that it's just not the posture, but it's the heart. It's the attitude of the heart that, that counts. It's David in Psalm 51 that we just heard. Prepare in me a clean heart, O God. If I could get away with just giving sacrifices, I would give them. But you don't want that. You want a heart that's changed by the gospel. And so it's with that attitude that he says, come and pray to the Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit so that he might show you his love. And so he tells us to pray on our knees and given the posture, pray from our hearts. But then he says, I want you to pray to our Father. And again, he reminds them that they're part of the family of God, one family, not Gentiles, not Jewish, but we're one family called the church. 
And he's overwhelmed because these are living stones from every kind of people, from every tribe who are indwelt by the kind of glory of God himself, by the power of the spirit of God. And we're so unified together that that becomes the thing that unites us, not divides us. And he says, so as you're part of this family, I want you to pray to the father of fathers. Now, again, many of us have horrible earthly father examples, and I want you to get beyond that because I want you to see what the scripture has to say. He says this in Matthew, of which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone, or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? See, he's the father of fathers. He is perfect in his character. He never gets it wrong. Even though we do here on earth. And Paul is saying, cry out to this father, for he hears you. And he hears you because he hears his son. And so Paul is interceding for the Gentiles, but he intercedes with two very specific petitions. And the first one, he's praying specifically for Christ to dwell in their hearts. And he, let's break this apart as we look at this. The first thing he says is, he says, I want you to have the power of God with you. Now, the power comes through one very specific agent. That's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, as he comes, brings about resurrection power. Again, Paul has already reminded us that this is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's the same power that raised Lazarus from the dead. Remember, Jesus comes to the tomb. He's already been in there. The, the women have said, Lord, don't call him out. He stinks. He's been decaying for days. And what does Jesus do? Jesus runs into the tomb, picks him up, gives him a little CPR, brings in a, D, a, a thing and punches his heart and gets him, shocks him back to existence. No, all he does is he stands out and he says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus walks out of the tomb. This is the same Holy Spirit that is in you if you are a Christian. It's why there is real change that is possible in our lives. It's why you can pray for the person that you have on your list that you're just like, God's not going to save this person. God can't save this person. Try him. Pray to him that God would do the impossible because as the spirit moves, lives are changed. And so he says, you have this power, but I want you to be changed in your inner being. Now, it's talking about the inner being or inner man. And it, we know from uh, 2 Corinthians 4, and we'll get there, that there's a difference between the outer man and the inner man. And the outer man is what we walk around in. It's these shells. And it is wasting away. Again, the older I get, the more people I hear Getting old is not fun. Our eyesight goes. Things pop. Things have to be cut off our bodies. There's hair in places we don't, and there's not hair in places we want. All these things happen because we're constantly wasting away. But Paul says, I want your inner man, the thing that is changed, the thing that is dwelt by the Holy Spirit, that is what should be renewed and transformed. Listen to 2 Corinthians 4, 15 and 16. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Now listen, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. So it's this understanding that, again, every day we need the Holy Spirit to come in through the Word and through prayer, and He needs to renew us so that we can deal with the suffering, so we can deal with witnessing to our friends, so that we can deal with the moral choices we have. We need Him to lead and to renew us and to restore us onto that right relationship. And so Paul says, I want you to have this power, and I want it to be in your inner being so that Christ may, what? Dwell. Now, again, this is kind of a, a weird statement. Why do I say that? Because if you're a Christian, you already have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. 
So why does Paul say that he wants the Holy Spirit to dwell within you again? Well, it's an understanding of residence. He wants the Holy Spirit to be fuller and stronger in possession of our lives. He wants it to be a permanent thing where we are set up in such a way that Christ is dwelling in our hearts, making deep roots, which means that he is coming about by bringing a Christ-forming understanding. D.A. Carson, in regards to this, talked about getting a home. And he said uh, when they moved here to the States, uh, some people uh, put together some money so that they might have a down payment on a home and get it out of the apartment. But he said what they moved to was truly a fixer-upper. And so they had the down payment. They went into the home And they said they moved into a place that had black and silver wallpaper throughout the house. They had many pets, and there was still dog poo and urine stains. The plumbing was messed up, and so was the wiring. But he said it was ours. But what they did is they started to find themselves ripping up the carpet and tearing down the wallpaper, moving walls, changing the pipes, changing the wiring, all knowing it was going to be a process and it was going to take time and effort. But they were creating that that fixture upper to be their permanent home. It's the same with Christ. Christ, when he comes into our hearts, he has to start moving things around. He has to clean up your dog poo, your urine stains the horrible wallpaper decision you made. He's got to fix the pipes. He's got to enlarge a room. He's got to add on. It's a process that he takes, and he constantly is forming himself within us. He's making a permanent residence. Listen to what Romans chapter 8 says, starting at verse 9 through 15. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, If in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you, for anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, and you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we also might be glorified with him. See, he dwells with us in such a way, and it happens because of why? His own riches. Listen, we have spiritual poverty. We bring nothing. We bring nothing to Christ. And our love for sin competes, and a lot of times even supersedes our love for Christ. It's why sometimes I say we're in danger of credal Christians, people who say the right things but then have no love and no relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not enough just to know the right theology. It's not bad. It's part of what we hope for. It's part of what we desire is that we would think rightly, that we would think rightly according to the Word of God. But if we don't have love, then what does the Bible say? We're a clanging symbol. And people aren't going to listen if they don't see how Christ has changed us. See, he's the one who supplies. And all we have to do is ask. Ask. And from his glorious riches, that's what it says, his glorious riches that's secured in the gospel, he gives to us freely. Because here's the thing. Even though we struggle in our love for God, God loves you more. And he never lets us go. 
And so that leads to the second petition that Paul prays for the Ephesians. So he says, I want Christ to dwell in your hearts. I want him to do the fixer upper. But then I want you more than anything is I want you to recognize the strength that you have in God's love. And the first thing he talks about is it's a secured love. Now, I want you to understand that this isn't our love for God because that waxes and wanes, right? There are definitely times where I've said, when is God going to stop loving me? Or God's done this in my life because I've deserved it and I'm being punished. See, that's not how God works. But I don't want to diminish that there are real struggles These are real feelings that we have. But the Apostle Paul is doing something for us that he wants us to truly grasp and understand that it's not our love for God that matters, it's God's love for us is the thing that matters. And he says, this is where your foundation, he says says it in two different terms. He says, it's rooted in an agricultural term, and it's a foundation It's a construction term. We have to have our sure foundation in God's love for us. And see, when we have a firm foundation, then it gives us the freedom to see our sin. And when we see our sin and how great it is and how immense it is, we are therefore able to go to the cross and then to feel secure in the love of God that no matter what we do, it's not anything that can ever separate us from him. And some of you need to hear that this morning. It doesn't matter what you have done. If you are Christ, there is nothing that separates you from him. Nothing. And I don't care how bad your life has been. I don't care how many times you have been divorced. I don't care how many times you've been drunk. I don't care how many times you've been promiscuous. I don't care how many times. Nothing separates us from the love of God. And so Paul wants them to grasp this and understand, and he says, I want you to go to the cross. And sometimes, sometimes we even have to sing it to ourselves, don't we? Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. As I was doing this study, one of the songs that came up was The Love of God by Frederick Lehman, who wrote it in 1917. And I didn't know any of the backstory, and so I started to do a little looking. So Frederick Lehman in 1917 is in California, and he begins to collaborate, and he wrote two verses of the song with his daughter who put together the chorus and put together the, the music. But in that day, in the 1917, you had to have a song that pretty much had three stanzas. And for the life of him, he couldn't come up with a third one. But he remembered, it says, that he had a a poem that he had written down. Now, again, this is where the story gets a little messed up because I'm not sure which one is true. But the story goes is that it was written down by a man in a sane asylum before he was taken off for his death. And ultimately, he was connected to a Jewish poem. I want you to listen to what they have put together. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Could we with ink the ocean filled and were the skies of parchment made? Were every stock on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade. To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, the sketch from sky to sky. And this is the verse that they found on the wall. O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forever more endure the saints and angel song. Do you feel the love of Christ for you? Do you revel in the love of Christ for you? Because he never changes. He never forsakes and he's never unfaithful. 
So the Apostle Paul wants them to understand the security that they find in the foundation of Christ's love, but he also wants them to know that they find strength within the church. Listen, there are no lone rangers. And yes, there are family squabbles. And I get it. I get to see truly as a pastor the best of the best at times and the worst of the worst. And a lot of times it's during marriages and funerals where tensions are high and family members are brought together and I get to hear of all the family squabbles that have ever happened. But it's also the place where I get to see forgiveness and restoration and grace lived out person to person. See, he tells us that we are to be united together. Chuck Sundahl says this, when we are grounded in unconditional love, we become agents of peace, unity, and reconciliation rather than people of strife, discord, and conflict. See, when we grasp the unconditional love that we receive from God and how much he loves us and cares for us, then we begin to love the right way to other people. And it's too easy. Listen, it is too easy for us to only trust ourselves. And so Paul says, I want you to look at the saints. And he uses a statement. We're not really sure. The commentaries are are different on this. It says that you might know the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth of the love of God. And we don't know exactly how that connects. But we do recognize that it does speak of dealing with people who are deep in sin. And maybe you are deep in sin today and you've come to this place and you're looking for the love and forgiveness. And Christ says, come back. Maybe you're someone who has wandered far off from God where you just, you know who God is, but you just want to do your own thing. You want to do it on your own time. You want to do it your own way. And God says, come back. Come back home. Maybe you're the weary Christian. You're so tired. God, I don't know how I can do this one more day, one more hour. He tells you, come to me for my burden is light. Or maybe you've just been content with not going deep with Christ. And he says, come. Come and spend time with me. Those who thirst and hunger, I will feed you and I will take you to the well of living water. This happens by us interacting with one another. And I want you to think of it sort of like in this illustration. I'm someone who's a a creature of habit. So I go to the same restaurants, and when I go to the same restaurant, I get the same meal. And if you go with me, I can take you to some waitresses who don't even ask me. They just bring me that food. But there has to be times where I go to, and I know for some people, this is a hardship. There are some times where you have to go to a buffet. Why? Because you need to taste new things. I love the buffets because you get a little bit of this and you get a little bit of that. Because if I go to a normal Chinese restaurant, I get the same thing. Kung Pao chicken. Spicy. But at the buffet, I can get a little bit of the sweet chicken. I can get a little broccoli and and, uh, meat there. I can get a little bit of uh, whatever. Do you understand that that's a grace of God? That we're brought into a family where we get to taste and see how God ministers and deals with each one of us differently. Every pain that you've gone through is for a purpose, and God uses it to minister to somewhere else. And those that have been living long enough recognize that God doesn't waste pain. He uses it to bring glory to himself. Listen, there's more the love of God when we're together than we're, when we're alone. So he tells them, be encouraged by the strength of the the love that you find in the church. But then he finishes by saying, the love that we have from Christ is limitless. So we need to know the love of God. We can never get away from it. And isn't that a cool thing? It should be a, a thing that is overwhelming to us. No matter where we go, no matter where we find ourselves, 
He's always there with us. Because he's always there with us. One of the pastors, and I didn't get to write his name down, one of the pastors that said this, he says, it's not, we need to be drunk on the love of God. We need to be so overwhelmed by his love that it, we're giddy with joy. See, we need to be so overwhelmed by his love that Paul finishes up, he says, I want you to have the fullness of Christ within you. Now, there's a, a great illustration and I want to, as we're finishing up, see, we can't know God exhaustively, but we can know him truly. And the example that was given was uh, this family was going to the, to the beach. And so the girl took out a jar and she filled it up with ocean water. She brought it back and she actually took it in the car and they found it. And they were just like to the daughter, what are you doing? And she's like, I'm bringing the ocean to us. Now, in one sense, she is, Right? It is the ocean water. And so she had it truly, but she didn't have it exhaustively. Here's the application. The more that we grow in our knowledge and our understanding of who God is, the bigger his love becomes. Not exhaustive. So I can go from that jar of ocean water. I can put it into an aquarium. I can have a big aquarium. I can even go to SeaWorld and have animals swim in salt water, but it's still not the ocean. See, that's the encouragement. He says, I want you to be so overwhelmed with the love of who God is and the love of Christ that you continually grow deeper and bigger in your understanding so that you grasp just how deep and wide and the length and the desires of all your heart, all that stuff is found within Christ. Do we believe it? So these are the petitions that Paul's praise for the Ephesian, he prays it for us. May God dwell in your hearts. May he finish the fixer-upper in you. And may you, more than anything, grow deep in your love and understanding of just how much God loves you. First and foremost. You know, when we struggle with prayer, the weird thing is, is as you look at Scripture, it's those who are more aware of God's sovereignty in the Bible, they are the ones who prayed the most. And I think it's because they knew and they had experienced the love of Christ that surpasses all understanding. May this be your prayer. And may you intercede for those around you. May Christ dwell in you richly. And may you know the love of God intimately. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know I needed to hear this this week. It's too easy to keep our eyes focused upon the world, troubles, tribulations, our own shortcomings. And Father, we know that's not a, a bad thing to do all the time is to confess our sins. We need to recognize the sin and just how deep and how dark it goes. But Father, thank you that you don't leave us there. That Father, you give us the understanding and the insight into just how great your grace and mercy are. That you take sinners and you gave your son, your only son, for people who hated you who cursed you, who rebelled against you, and you gave your perfect son to die for our sins 
but even more than that, that you gave to us the perfection of your Son to us, that we might be called heirs, brothers and sisters united to Jesus Christ, and we get the privilege to call you Father. We get to run to you and bring our concerns, all of them, to you, all of our confessions, all of our anxieties, all of our hatred, all of our undoing. And you make us new. And you transform us into the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, may that be our prayer. May that be our desire that we would go forth and to build your kingdom, doing what you've taught us today, interceding for those around us, whether near or far, that you would dwell in our hearts and we would know the love of God for us. For this we pray in Christ's name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.